Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Tax Talk, broadcast by the Canadian Taxpayers Federation and powered by RoadkillRadio.com. My name is Jordan Bateman, and I am the British Columbia Director for the CTF, a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to three things lower taxes, less waste, and more government accountability. That's what frames all of the advocacy, communications, and research work we do. Thank you for joining us today. We hope this episode will educate and entertain you, inspire and even infuriate you from time to time, but most importantly, give you a better picture of the challenges facing our country today. If you log on to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash taxpayer.com or visit our blog at taxpayer.com slash blog, you'll be able to see all of our new Tax Talk episodes as they come on stream, or you can download the audio podcast via iTunes. But first, today's comment of the cast. Every episode, we highlight a comment left either on taxpayer.com or via social media. Last week, the CTF's Ontario director, Candace Malcolm, joined us to talk about the Ontario Liberals' decision to scrap two gas-fired power plants in order to save their electoral hides in the last election. That little campaign goodie cost taxpayers $1.1 billion. And now the chickens are coming home to roost as Ontario electrical rates spiked 7.5% this fall. Nikita Shera of Ontario is not happy and commented on our Facebook post that, quote, those earning big salaries that made the mistake should pay for it. I still have the charge on my Horizon Utilities bill, a debt retirement charge. The rich do not pay for it. The poor who earns not even a living wage has to pay for it. Meanwhile, they live the high life. When another commenter noted to Nikita that she had been told the debt retirement charge would be there forever, Nikita couldn't help but reply, lucky us. Nikita is bang on. Ontario taxpayers are being held hostage by the litany of terrible decisions by the Kathleen Wynne government. But while the fat cats cling to power and their huge paychecks, it's the little people, the taxpayers, who are suffering. Thanks for commenting, Nikita. We want to hear from you. You can check out our website at taxpayer.com or email me at bc.director at taxpayer.com. You can follow the CTF on Twitter at taxpayer.com or myself at Jordan Bateman and engage on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash taxpayer.com. Or you can leave a comment on this video in our YouTube stream, but drop us a note so that you can be our comment of the cast next time. Earlier this month, BC Premier Christy Clark and Alberta Premier Alison Redford struck a deal to reinforce BC's five conditions for oil pipelines in this province. The most contentious point, money for BC, was essentially deferred to private talks between the BC government and the pipeline companies, leaving Alberta free and clear of what could be a messy process. Still, there are significant implications for British Columbia, Alberta, and of course Canada as a whole. Joining me now to talk about all this is Derek Fildebrandt, the Alberta Director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Derek, thank you for joining us. No, thanks for having me. Derek, what a difference an election makes. I mean, as recently as this spring, Premier Clark was getting nowhere with Alberta on her five conditions for pipelines. And now we have a deal where Alberta essentially reinforces them. What do you make of all this? Well, we've got a deal to have a deal. It's, I, I, I'd be careful before you really call this anything concrete. Uh, I think what we've agreed, they've agreed to is um, you know, it's a pretty, very vague, very broad outline uh, if we can actually get this done, it's going to be fantastic for taxpayers and the economy in both provinces. I mean, uh, here in Alberta, I mean, more royalties means, uh, well, it should mean less taxes. It probably just means the government spends more. But in theory, it means uh, we can we can be saving more if we were saving in Alberta, which we're not. But if we were, uh, but it is a new revenue stream that doesn't come from taxpayers. It'll reinforce the economy. Uh, and and, on, and it'll be the same thing, although to a, to a lesser extent in British Columbia. New economic activity means new tax revenues, takes the burden off of B.C. taxpayers. Uh, what they've agreed to here, though, is that the B.C. government won't be taking revenues directly from Alberta royalties, which would be unconstitutional. So that, I don't know how that never could have been on the table to begin with. It's not constitutional, but it seemed to have been on the table. It's now off. Now Premier Clark is going to be uh, negotiating directly with Enbridge, and well, Enbridge isn't taxpayers, and so that makes us happy. Yeah. Now, one of the fascinating parts of the story is the fact that, essentially, the joint meeting between the two premiers was cancelled the night before, and a happenstance occurrence 
two communications directors, one from Alberta, one from British Columbia, running into each other at a bar uh, in, in Vancouver, I guess. They happen to run into each other. They get talking about these issues. And lo and behold, they're able to flesh out uh, the bare bones of an agreement that then goes back to the premiers and, and the senior staff for, uh, for their vetting. You know, this is, this is a, almost an uncanny occurrence in Canadian politics, isn't it? The, uh, these kind of secret backroom, last minute deals in order to, uh, to help premiers and, and uh, other politicians save face. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe after a few beers at the bar, these guys realized uh, how silly it was that in one country we can't come to an agreement to move uh, products through provincial borders. Um, the idea of Canada in 1867 was that we have a single common market and that we don't have uh, border guards uh, trying to prevent economic activity between the provinces. So it, it is kind of bizarre that it came to this to begin with, but... Uh, yeah, I guess maybe after a few beers, they realize how, how silly it was that their governments couldn't come to an agreement. Um, they, they, they seem to say that really there was no agreement, a disagreement all along, but that they just had to figure it out. It's, it, it, the, the details are pretty hazy. But again, uh, the details of their agreement is pretty hazy. It is an agreement to have an agreement, and I'm optimistic that it will result in a pipeline. Uh, but you know, then again, you know, there's, there's no uh, meat on the bones. At the same time, it is kind of strange that either of our premiers are even involved in this. I mean, first of all, uh, the British Columbia government has no constitutional authority to prevent the construction of a pipeline. Um, on the Alberta side, uh, the government of Alberta will not own the pipeline. It will be owned by Enbridge. So it's kind of strange why we're talking about it. The only government with any role in this, at least officially, should be the federal government, the National Energy Board. That said, politics are different uh, than the constitutional uh, niceties here. Uh, Premier of Alberta has a clear stake in getting the pipeline built, even if it's a private pipeline, because it's going to meet new revenues for government. And the, the, you know, the Premier of BC has an interest in securing as much economic uh, activity as possible, and also ensuring that the appropriate environmental um, uh, thresholds are met. But regardless, neither of these premiers have any a constitutional stake in it. So it's kind of strange. The only the only real parties to this should be the federal government and Enbridge. Yeah. Uh, politics, though, demands, uh, demands something else, as you stated. Now, Premier Redford has been touting her Canadian energy strategy, which, is, as part of this deal, uh, Premier Clark signed on to. Uh, what can you tell me about that, and, and what do you make of Redford's plan? Um, well, I, I think that when it was first announced, people said national energy strategy and... <laughs> in- Anything that starts with national energy uh, makes the hair stand up on the backs of, uh, of Alberta's necks. I mean, in Texas, it's remember the Alamo. In Alberta, it's remember the national energy program. Yeah. Uh, that is, <laughs> that's seared in everyone's minds. So we're always leery of allowing anyone outside of the province to, uh, to have a say over what we're doing here. What the national energy strategy has meant Frankly, I'm not sure anyone, including the Premier, is really known from the get-go, other than it means we talk to other people, and there's nothing wrong with that. The question is, doesn't mean other provinces have a say over, over our own economic, uh, over our own energy strategy. Um, so far, I think, even though we don't know what it means, uh, <laughs> and it's just kind of going along, you know, she might, might be making it up as she goes along, perhaps we're starting to see that whatever it is vaguely defined is working. Um, you know, if, if we've gotten Christy Clark to sign on, if we've gotten at least uh, a tentative plan for pipelines from, uh, from Alberta to the East Coast, you know, um, she must be doing something, right? I mean, Premier Redford uh, probably, you know, certainly got her fault, but I think she is good as a diplomat. She's, I mean, perhaps this is her UN background, um, uh, for better or worse, I mean, in this case, it's for better. She's she's a good negotiator. She's able to talk with other people and strike a deal. Um, on, you know, on some other things, she's perhaps not been um, the best negotiator for Alberta. Well, on the pipeline side, I think her national energy strategy, whatever the heck that actually is, is perhaps starting to finally take some form. Yeah. You know, in BC, we, we're having this, uh, we often hear about what's called social license, where these companies, these uh, pipeline builders, you know, apparently have to have a social license, permission from, from I guess, a, a consensus of British Columbians before they can proceed. This seems to be very different than some of the uh, undercurrent in, in Alberta, where social license on these kind of projects is, 
is implied. I mean, you see the benefits, you understand it. How do you see social license playing out in British Columbia? And, and is this really the the main problem here, a, a cultural difference really between a lot of British Columbians and, and the bulk of Alberta? You know, actually, I don't know there's that much difference in the idea of social license between Albertans uh, and British Columbians. I think social license is easily confused with nimbyism, not yes. in my backyardism. Uh, social license means not uh, democratic approval of something, but the people locally affected having a say. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, nobody wants, um, everybody seems to favor, uh, everybody in downtown Toronto favors wind power, but nobody in downtown Toronto wants to see a windmill. They want it in somebody else's backyard. Uh, everybody knows we need economic activity, we need to be pumping oil, but nobody wants an oil derrick, no pun intended, uh, in their backyard. Uh, social license, I think, is you know, somewhere between nimbyism and democratic consent. You know, so even if the majority in the province vote for a government that supports uh, economic development, the development of natural resources, uh, do they still need the approval of, of local people, people who actually might not even own that land? Um, so there's actually something to be said, I think, for social license. I mean, you know, if uh, even if I don't own land, I have an interest in ensuring that the neighboring lands to me don't uh, don't suffer oil spills. You know. Uh, you and I are both in favor of resource development, but neither of us would want to spill in our backyards. Um, so I, I think there is a degree to which local people have a say over that. That, that being said, for some people, it, it's not reasonable. For some people, it's an ideological crusade. It's an anti-oil crusade, anti-business crusade, anti-corporatism. Um, for those people, I mean, they're never going to be happy. There's nothing we can do. Uh, no amount of environmental regulation and protection or guaranteed economic benefits is going to make it worth it because it's an ideological point. Yeah. So, you know, social license needs to stop at nimbyism. Yeah. Alberta and BC have agreed to not talk money, i.e. BC is not going to request a share of Alberta's royalties if this pipeline or any pipeline is built. Instead, British Columbia will negotiate with the individual companies. The uh, question that I've been wrestling with, Derek, is, is this a tax increase on those companies? Or is it just one of the costs of doing business? Where do you come down in that debate? Well, it might be a bit of both. Um, I, th I think it's, uh, it's a pretty safe bet that uh, Premier Christy Clark is going to demand a chunk of money uh, from Enbridge for this. You know, Andrew Coyne said it well today. I won't take credit for what he said. Uh, you know, the first four of her uh, five points are about protection of the environment, protection of local populations, Aboriginal concerns, all of these things. And then the fifth one, the fifth condition is that BC gets a greater share of uh, the economic benefits um, because it's carrying risks. But the first four points are ensuring that Enbridge carries all of the risks. And the fifth one is saying they want compensation for risks, even though the first four points ensure that BC carries none of those risks. So it's a bit, uh, it's a bit self-contradictory in that sense. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure, um, on Enbridge's part, I think uh, it's going to mean a higher cost uh, cost of doing business. It's uh, it, it it probably the, the BC government might not have any technical jurisdiction to do this, but I think there's a wide recognition in Alberta that hey, we got to get this thing built. Um, it's hurting the Canadian economy. It's hurting the Alberta economy. It's frankly embarrassing that we can't transport uh, goods across interprovincial borders. We're not trying to move this into Singapore. We're trying to move it into the Kootenays, you know, so it's, um, I, I, there's an acknowledgement that it's the price of doing business, but it's probably going to come with an unofficial tax or an official tax on Enbridge's part, mm -hmm. but Enbridge, uh, I can't speak for them, obviously, but they might be willing to swallow it because the economic benefits are so great. Yeah. Brass tax time here, Derek. How much more likely are we to see the Enbridge and Kinder Morgan pipelines built today than we were a month ago. Does, it, does any of this even matter in light of the fact it's really a federal decision? Well, you know, it is. It's federal jurisdiction. Alberta technically has no say in this. BC technically has no say. It's Enbridge and it's, uh, and it's the federal government. But we all know the politics are very different. The BC government could have made life quite miserable for the federal government. The federal government uh, might not want to risk. It's, uh, there's a lot of federal conservative seats there that are not rock solid uh, and could go back and forth with the NDP. And I think that 
politics means that uh, the federal government much preferred that Alberta and BC do a deal rather than the federal government do it, despite it being the federal government's jurisdiction. Uh, but, you know, there, there's greater implications to this than just the Northern Gateway Pipeline. I think the Americans are now going to have to scratch themselves, uh, perhaps hit themselves in the side of the head, and say, well, the Canadians are now going to be selling their oil to China, and we're still importing from Saudi Arabia, from Nigeria, dirty oil countries, countries with horrible human rights and democratic records, uh, and the Canadians are now going to sell their oil to China. Um, it raises, other, it raises geopolitical questions for the United States, and it makes the United States look foolish at this point if they don't uh, approve Keystone. So getting approval on this one pipeline, and again, it's not approved. It's a deal to have a deal to maybe approve a deal. <laughs> um, but if, if, if this is a sign that the ball is really going to be rolling now and we're past the biggest political hurdles, at least, uh, that I think it's got geopolitical implications for the United States and improve the conditions of us getting Keystone XL. Yeah, absolutely. Now, while I have you, I know municipal elections just wrapped up in Alberta. Can you give us your sense as to what happened in Calgary and Edmonton? Were the election results there good news for taxpayers or not? Uh, I'm more optimistic about the way things turned out uh, in my own city here in Calgary. In Calgary, um, obviously, Mayor Nenshi cruised to re-election uh, without any major campaign uh, mounted against him directly. Uh, but what happened is some of the more uh, spendthrift members of the city council here were turfed. And we now have a majority on city council, nine, who have committed in writing, uh, actually many of them to the, direct, the Canadian Taxpayers Federation directly, that they're going to return the 52 million that the that the provincial sorry that the municipal government scooped up from the provincial tax break money that didn't belong to them. So we've got a majority of council who are on the record uh, supporting returning that 52 million to property taxpayers in next year's budget and holding the line on property tax increases to the rate of inflation uh, CPI. Now the mayor is uh, steadfastly opposed to either holding the line on taxes or returning the 52 million to taxpayers. But we've got a majority of council now, uh, after the election, that we didn't have before the election, uh, that holds that position. So I think there has been a, a decisive shift in the balance of power on council that uh, should make life easier over the next four years for taxpayers. In Edmonton, um, well, yeah, not looking good. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, Mandel, Mayor Mandel, um, really sold taxpayers out to big business with the Cates deal. Uh, we're going to see more of that. Uh, the, the new mayor has, uh, has committed to, uh, to continue in that stream, perhaps even more. We asked, we asked the mayor um, if he'll refuse any further, um, any further government bailouts of uh, Daryl Cates' private NHL arena, and frankly, uh, he left the door wide open to even more money under certain circumstances. So I'm not terribly optimistic about the way things are going to work in Edmonton. Um, hopefully a new mayor just means a new perspective, and we could be a bit more cooperative than we are able to, to be with, with Mayor Mandel. But, you know, I'm not holding my breath. Yeah, you bring up the Kate Serena. Now, in Calgary, I understand that 10 of the 15 councillors who were elected oppose public funding to refurbish or, or build a new saddle dome. Can they stick to that in light of what Edmonton is doing? And how much pressure are the Flames actually putting on uh, the city to get some money going? I think they absolutely can stick to it. I mean, we have a decisive majority on council who is completely against taxpayer funding for a professional NHL arena. Uh, it would go against, the, go against the political culture of Calgary. Um, Mayor Nenshi said he was opposed to it, but, you know, in all these questions we did in our survey to, uh, to, uh, to council and mayoral candidates, Mayor Nenshi was very difficult to understand. He often answered yes to something and then give a no in a written answer, or give a no and then give a yes uh, in a written answer. Um, and it was somewhere along the, somewhat similar to that on, on the arena question. He just certainly did keep the door open to it, but... There's a decisive majority on council that's completely opposed any public funding for a professional arena. So far as I've heard, there's been very little rumblings from the Flames' ownership about trying to bilk taxpayers for this, the way it's happened in Edmonton. Uh, that said, these things take place behind closed doors. Um, I'm not sure what's taking place behind closed doors, but we haven't heard much yet. And, and I just 
have a hard time believing that uh, taxpayers in Calgary would uh, would sit for it. Yeah. All right. One last issue. Uh, you sent out a news release recently on the Elbow Park School Gymnasium. Now, those of us out here think to ourselves, oh, a, a new gym or temporary gymnasium uh, for a school that was ravaged by floods. Uh, it sounds like a good news story. It turns out it's not. Uh, a sole sourced contract uh, given to someone with political connections. Tell me about that story and, and the feedback you're getting on it. Yeah, it's uh, it's really quite a doozy. I mean, you know, we've obviously been very supportive of uh, flood rebuilding measures. You know, my own neighborhood uh, was devastated by it. My own house was safe, but you know, we saw it firsthand, and we were supportive of uh, of rebuilding measures. It's got to be within reason. We can't cut the government a blank check on this, and I think the government uh, took advantage of that blank check uh, that uh, that many people did give them and abused it. And I think that's what we found in the case of uh, the Elbow Park School. What, what's happened here is uh, some of the schools that were damaged here in southern Alberta, they're having to either uh, move those students to schools that have excess capacity and fit them into those schools or move them uh, into uh, portables so that they've at least got somewhere to go. In, in High River, um, they desperately need even more portables. There's kids taking classes in cafeterias because they don't have enough portables. Um, in Elbow Park, by contrast, which is in Premier Redford's riding, uh, it's an older neighborhood. It's not growing. So there's an excess capacity of room for students in nearby schools. It's been argued you could even move the entire Elbow Park school intact, at least its students, to one of those schools. At the very least, uh, at the very worst, they'd have to divide it into two different schools, but they keep all the grades together. Um, that is what the Calgary Board of Education recommended after the flood, because and they said it was a waste of money to move them to uh, to have their own independent school with portables set up, especially when other schools uh, in the area desperately need portables because there's no excess capacity in other schools. The Elbow Park Residents Association met with uh, Premier Redford, who is the MLA for Elbow Park, and uh, and said, you know, we want to keep our, uh, we don't think that's good enough. We should just build some portables. We should have our own school. Um, we shouldn't be mixing with other schools. And that costs about uh, just over five million dollars to do. And that was controversial enough because these portables are actually needed in other areas that don't have excess capacity. That was one thing. But then it got a lot fishier when uh, when we found, uh, well, when uh, the government made a sole source contract to Sprung Instant Structures to build a gymnasium on top of that. Even though uh, the students where these portables are at, uh, there's already a gymnasium on site. They just have to share the gymnasium with other students. That apparently wasn't good enough. But where things really started to get bizarre uh, is when the Canadian Taxpayers Federation revealed that the president of the Elbow Park Residents Association, which lobbied the premier directly uh, for uh, the building of this uh, temporary gymnasium, is also the vice president. Uh, his name is uh, Tim Sprung. And Tim Sprung is also the vice president of Sprung Instant Structures, which the premier gave a sole source contract to. So president of the Residents Association and the Premier is writing, and normally politicians want to be friends with the president of a Residents Association. The president of the Residents Association lobbies the Premier that they should build this structure. The Premier turns around and gives a sole source contract to that exact same man to build it without a tendering process, no competition. Um, you know, and this wasn't near the flood. This was decided uh, very recently, close to Halloween. I mean, there's no reason for a sole source contract. We weren't still underwater. So it, it smells pretty bad, and we're still poking around for more details. Yeah. Friends and insiders seem to benefit, unfortunately. To follow Derek on Twitter, check out at DFildebrandt. Derek, thank you. Keep up the great work in Alberta. I appreciate you joining us today. Thanks, sir. You keep up, too. Now it's time for Waste of the Week, an example of how government is wasting your hard-earned tax dollars. This week we go to Ottawa. Fun fact. There has not been a volcanic eruption in Canada for 238 years. Let's put that into perspective. That's more than a century before Confederation, and even before the United States rebelled against England. It's almost as long as the last time the Toronto Maple Leafs were relevant. It's been a while since any of Canada's two dozen volcanoes have erupted. However, Canadian taxpayers, through the Department of Natural Resources, employ a full-time, and I'm not making this word up, folks, a volcanologist. Someone who keeps an eye on those 24 dormant Canadian volcanoes. 
borderline defendable, I suppose, although volcanoes rarely spontaneously erupt. I mean, they almost always give off warning signs ahead of time. But here's the story of the waste. Natural Resources Canada is now out hiring a second on-call volcanoologist to work weekends and holidays when volcanoologist number one is off. So you've had more than two centuries in this country without an eruption, but we need an emergency on-call volcanoologist working on your dime. Where is the common sense? Well, that's it for this episode of Tax Talk from the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. You can check out our website at taxpayer.com or email me at bc.director at taxpayer.com. You can check us out on Twitter at taxpayer.com or myself at Jordan Bateman and engage on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash taxpayer.com. Thank you for tuning in. And until next time, I'm Jordan Bateman asking you to remember this quote from Will Rogers. Quote, the only difference between death and taxes is that death doesn't get worse every time Congress meets. Take care, everybody.